Hello, everyone, and good morning. A big audience. <laughs> I'm here to talk with you about being a maverick, about not following the crowd. If you were a maverick, you'd love to be recruited to do a TED talk like this because, by definition, a maverick expects to get left out. Over the years, I've become a passionate maverick. Today, I hope to invite you to become a maverick who loves yourself and the maverick in others. And you'll want to know some serious mistakes to avoid. But first, do you think being a maverick is a good thing or a bad thing? So, can you put your hands up if you think it's a good thing? And put your hands up if you think it's a bad thing. I think I've got you already converted, that's good. And put your hands up if you're not sure. Okay. Well, one thing's for sure. You've all got hands and minds of your own. And that is all you need to be a maverick. So what makes a maverick? I think we all do maverick things, but we may not call it that. A really memorable maverick is unrepeatable, a one-off. Many famous people have been maverick when you think about it. Jesus, Joan of Arc, Gandhi, Rosa Parks, uh, Dyson, and many other entrepreneurs and artists. Rarely do women fancy being called maverick. But why shouldn't they make a noise about themselves like men do? The original Samuel Maverick was a, an energetic lawyer and a land baron. They said he was too lazy a rancher to brand his cattle, which became known as mavericks. So maverick refers to the cattle, and it means independent-minded, and unbranded cattle. They don't belong to any club. Like the cattle, Groucho Marx famously declared, I refuse to join any club that would have me as a member. So it's a paradox. The maverick needs the club to refuse to join it, and the club prevents the maverick from spinning off into outer space. At its best, the refusal to join is constructive. You want to think outside the club's box to improve the club's established ways. So let's explore some more examples. Even if we stick to constructive mavericks, remember that they may be seen as terrorists or heretic and be burnt at the stake if they're not careful. Galileo was a heretic who survived. Copernicus before him he did the maths that showed the sun was at the center of the solar system, but he didn't make a noise about it. It was Galileo's telescopic proof and his strategic sustained campaigning that made him a great maverick. Child psychiatrist John Bowlby was a bit of a maverick. He broke ranks with psychoanalysis to invent both attachment theory and family therapy. But he couldn't build both fields. So he chose one and dropped the other. Like Bowlby, mavericks may discover something new and settle down in their new shop. Others keep moving on. Their good work disappears in the dust. John McMurray, he had revolutionary ideas, but he was not a maverick. A Scots philosopher, he redid the whole of philosophy from a new starting point. Instead of man the thinker looking out on the world around, McMurray says we are all primarily engaged in doing things in the world, starting with personal relationships. Thinking is essential, but secondary to the doing. Now, McMurray was a senior professor, a fully paid out member of his club. Yet they have rejected his ideas. 
If he was right, he or somebody else needed to do some much better public relations for him. Most mavericks are not good at public relations. They can't do it all themselves, and no institution will do it for them. So mavericks are not lazy. Um, a dedicated maverick always has work to do. If you're going to go out on a limb, you've got to think a lot harder. Mavericks can set out on their own right away, but most of you are going to prefer to work your way up inside a professional organization as far as you can bear to before you jump out. Um, that way you get a whole range of advantages and skills to really free up your maverick powers. A maverick goes it alone. But Arlo Guthrie, in his song Alice's Restaurant, tells of how just a few people singing the song go a lot further than the lone wolf does. I'm, I'm a cowardly maverick. Um, I prefer a small team to help me shape up my best ideas. But we will see how that teaming up can be a problem too. So, would you like to hear how I got started? Actually, with me, it didn't start with passion. It started with being puzzled and confused. Okay, you say, we've all been confused. But for me, mystification led to a passion for demystification. If you're driven to demystify things, you're bound to be a maverick. My original confusion was the confusion of being in a fog, not seeing what, but knowing something was there. Home from boarding school, I remember puzzling about why I couldn't get into the Christmas spirit. Being shushed going round a cathedral, I didn't see why I should shush. With little career guidance, doing medicine seemed a good way to help others and to learn about being human. Not very maverick. I don't know about medicine now, but in my day, it was about bodies and careers, not about people. But I wasn't brave enough then to break away. Flower power medics like us headed for psychiatry and child psychiatry, but they weren't about people either. Strange language and ideas kept adding to the fog. So I kept demystifying, though I did have the help of McMurray's philosophy then. I was too unconventional to get a consultant post in the centers of excellence. The peripheries of excellence turned out to be just the ticket for me. I loved that colleagues in the centers ran the institution. From the peripheries, you could pick the bits you liked. This maverick took off. It was the 1980s. Now, here's what happens to a maverick in a group. For example, in the group teaching of psychiatry, Henry Walton would teach us that group process makes individuals conform. All the other trainees were agreeing with him, but I argued to the end. I remember it well. Conforming or not reminds us of Solomon Ash's social compliance experiment. Ash set up a group of stooges to influence a real subject away from the true answer in a simple task. Everyone thinks they would tell the truth. Would you be maverick enough? Most subjects were not. As a maverick, you seek the truth, whatever the social pressure. Oh, unless, like Galileo, you have reason to be strategic about it. But Ash's experiment shows much more important stuff going on. We're so used to trickery that we think it's normal. What about trust and integrity, constructive ethical influence instead of Ash's tricky, undue influence, a blueprint for all coercive relationships and cultic groups? Bowlby, McMurray, Walton, Ash, they all remind us that we first see the world through our personal relationships. Through decades of good maverick work, I was making a big 
maverick mistake. Since the 60s, we and our hippie maverick ideas established ourselves alongside the actual establishment. Of course, we never took over, but we began to get our act together and to influence those who didn't agree. If we could get everyone to speak and behave properly, then that might be a good way to get them to think and be like us. We call this political correctness. Political correctness is our invisible kangaroo court to silence everyone else into conformity. Silencing people has always been a rotten substitute for proper conversation about different ideas. And now we have tweeting and trolling, which are nothing like talking. Silencing can be done with a click of a mouse, a virtual version of burning the heretic. To be clear, the world certainly needs ways to be respectful and inclusive. There are no easy ways. It's just that being PC has this serious flaw. Now, I can see some of you are not convinced yet, but that's okay. It took me years to get this. And if I get back to my story, it may help. There I was then, a maverick in a united team of fellow mavericks. We knew that our team service was highly rated. Our family systems approach helped children and families with their problems in living. But we didn't value the medical model and the diagnostic categories and labels. So we must have failed to recognize some disorders and to do a proper job. And of course, we completely dismissed a new import from across the Atlantic called parental alienation. Parental alienation is a family pattern, usually after separation, when one parent harmfully turns their child against the other parent for no good reason. It's real and it's devastating and professionals still rubbish it, just like we did. In our team, we didn't need to read a single thing about it to know that it was a nonsense. Everyone around us said it was. So alienation arrived and this ignorant prejudice continued into my next job as a family therapist in a small but beautiful team in the voluntary sector. Again, a highly valued service. One day, a client phoned up asking for help as an alienated parent. I was to call him back and politely explain that we couldn't really help him because we didn't believe in this idea. He gently got me to be more sensible. And then he sent me a textbook through the post. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know that something is wrong when a client sends a professional a textbook before they see you. That client and I worked hard for many months, learning together as we went ahead. But of course, everywhere we found the same ignorance as mine. Nothing changed his family alienation. So I wonder what you would have done if you had been me. I think you'd get maverick again, like I did. You'd want to make up for those years of incompetence. You would, wouldn't you? Six years later, that client and I are now maverick colleagues in a dedicated campaign about alienation from local to global, all done informally so far. Uh, oh, and we take care to disagree a lot. By the way, if you Google any of this, you'll find it's uh, not as simple as a, as a TED-sized talk makes out. Let's wind up with some maverick points. 
As a budding maverick, you'll want to remember this. A maverick must keep being maverick even in a united group of fellow mavericks. You've got to keep thinking because in the real world, the plot never ends. To help you love being maverick, remember it's a quality like others that we aspire to. Heroism, innovation, integrity, and rationality. And my story will help you remember the difference between being bold and the pride that comes before a fall. And we do take risks when we refuse to be branded. Like whistleblowers, you have to have courage and conviction. And you're at your most powerful when you have nothing to lose. So let's all celebrate both our established authorities and our mavericks. Because we're not good at self-promotion, we need others to spot us and to make our work known. Today, I hope you're now really ready to love the maverick in you and in others. And to end, here's something we can all applaud. Every TED talk across the world puts a maverick on the stage, and all of us today as well. So a special thanks to TED and TEDx for services to the maverick cause. Thank you, and thank TED. <laughs>